professor uh, in the Department of World Economy and High School of Economics. I'm also head of uh, the American sector, which exists on our faculty. So you can guess that actually my specialization is not Russian economy, but the economy of Latin America. But since we have this uh, perfect winter school, Professor Bruna asked me to do my best to prepare the lecture about Russian economy, and I hope that uh, I will do it quite nice. Okay, uh, the lecture about Brazilian economy by um, Professor Biancarelli was so brilliant. So um, I'm really impressed. Uh, uh, <laughs> Professor Biancarelli told us a lot about the long history of Brazil, and uh, I will try to concentrate on the modern period of Russian economy. Uh, Actually, the modern Russia has only 28 years, so the country is even younger than the majority of you. But uh, we can also uh, keep in mind that the history of this territory, of Russia, of Russian Empire, of the Soviet Union, and for sure of uh, modern Russia is really difficult. It's uh, really multiversal. So a lot of uh, circumstances uh, influenced Russian economy. <coughs> and you should also keep in mind the uh, historical context and political context. As I work uh, in the Faculty of World Economy and International Affairs, I always tell my students that there is no economics or economy without international relations and there are no international relations without economy. So these two sciences, these two processes are always uh, going hand by hand. So uh, all the economic issues should be uh, researched, should be investigated in the context of the political science and all the political issues should keep in mind economics uh, situation. Uh, for example, uh, the war, right? Uh, any war is a political issue, but for sure the core of any war is economics. You want, you want to capture land, to capture labor resources, to capture natural resources, and uh, the countries which do not participate in the war, they can gain by selling foods and weapons, etc., etc. So, war turns to be an economic issue. And vice versa. When I'm talking about economics, uh, the system can work perfectly. The countries can trade with, with each other during the centuries. But suddenly comes some crisis, like, for example, the Ukrainian crisis of 2014. And what we can see? The politics ruined the economy, right? So this food ban which exists between Russia and uh, the Western countries is not profitable for any of us. So from the economic point of view, this, um, this ban is something stupid, right? But since we have this political issue, this political crisis that still is on the stage, economics failed. So, and <coughs> this happens always. So, please uh, keep in mind that all what happened with uh, Russia during the USSR, during the uh, Russian Empire, during the modern history of Russia is always both economics and international relations. And just to start with, I'd like to quote our famous poet and diplomat, Fyodor Tuchiv, who tried to explain how should you understand Russia. So uh, you cannot understand Russia with your mind. You can't measure it 
with their standard instrument. This country has a particular status, right? In Russia, you can only trust. So uh, this is a brilliant expression of our brilliant point, and uh, I think during the lecture you will see that uh, to understand Russia, you need more than economic knowledge. You need more than international relations knowledge. You need to understand Russian history. You need to understand Russia, Russian culture, Russian keep of mind, etc., etc. The the really puzzle of different parts makes Russia. Uh, to look like it's now. So, um, they are brave characteristics of uh, modern um, uh, measures, uh, international measures of Russian economy. So, the national currency of Russia is Russian ruble, and the exchange rate you can see, so the quite fresh one. So, uh, now ruble is really depreciate on dollar, on, on euro, uh, because of the uh, fall of uh, international oil price for sure, and as a consequence of different crises, uh, monetary crisis and economic crisis caused uh, in the beginning of the 21st century. So as for the type of economy, we can uh, state that Russia is upper middle uh, income, uh, income economy and we can also call it transitional country while we are still in the transition from the uh, planned economy to the market economy so we are somewhere in between. As, as a financial market it's also uh, ranked as an emerging financial market. Uh, a member of G8, uh, not now, but in the context of this political crisis, but we really hope that it's not forever. So we, we will not, uh, we'll find find out the good decision which will be uh, appropriate for all sides. So the student G8 member and G20 member for sure. Uh, the largest country in the world. You can imagine that the land of Russia is really huge. Uh, Russia is also the leading producer and exporter of natural gas and the uh, second largest producer and exporter of petroleum. Uh, but still, with all these uh, measures, uh, poverty affects 16% of Russian population. So, poverty can be named as the common problem for all BRICS countries. So, uh, during the winter school, uh, we will also be able to uh, to talk about uh, measures of overcoming poverty. So GDP in period dollars is now 1.6. Uh, in uh, constant prices is 1.8, uh, and per capita is uh, 11,000. So uh, you can see that by these uh, macroeconomic measures, Russia can be ranked at the middle income economy, right? So, and if we measure the uh, percentage of different uh, economic sectors uh, in GDP, you can see that agriculture accounts 6.6, um, in uh, employment industry 26%, and services 66%. So, in this measure, we can uh, rank Russia as a developed economy, right? And in value added, so also agriculture accounts 4%, industry 30%, and services 56%. Uh, so it's quite a good international mark. Uh, by uh, nominal value of the economy of Russia, is the 11th largest economy in the world. And we have abundance of natural gas, oil, coal, and prestigious metals. Uh, we are also rich in agriculture. And uh, since the collapse of the USSR, uh, USSR, Russia has undergone significant changes um, in its economy, uh, moving from the central Atlantic economy to more market-based and uh, globally integrated economy. But just to give you a short hint, 
Uh, here are the periods of Russian history in 20th and 21st century. You can see that <coughs> there are a lot of different um, different highways, right, and uh, other uh, events which influence a lot Russian economy. So in the beginning of the 20th century, Russia was an empire, right? And as an empire, Russia, Russian economy was really powerful. For example, we were the number one exporter of wheat on the international market. So uh, the revolution which came in 1917, we cannot measure it till now, actually. So. Uh, one part of people think that revolution was the biggest gain of the 20th century, right? That the uh, uh, celebration of 100 years uh, anniversary of revolution uh, two years ago was huge in one part of Russia. But the second part of uh, Russian population think that revolution was the biggest mistake in Russian history, right? So now we cannot measure it, uh, whether it was good or bad. Actually, both, right? Because for sure uh, the revolution got, uh, for example, um, uh, primary and uh, secondary and high education to all people of Russia, not only from, um, elites from the one hand, but from the other hand, the revolution itself killed a lot of people, right? Because the civil war, uh, which was broken uh, after the revolution, split the country. So in the uh, in one family, there can be the representatives of uh, one part on another part. So they were fighting against each other, and a lot of clever people, a lot of scientists, a lot of the uh, elite also either were killed or they immigrated to other countries. So uh, uh, after, after the uh, civil war, there was slow recovery and then Stalin's industrialization, which uh, pushed country to be more industrialized than uh, to be an agricultural country and then the Second World War came for sure and the consequences of this war were really hard, right? Because a lot of people died, uh, a lot of industry were um, destructed um, and uh, for sure the reindustrialization uh, was necessary to rebuild all uh, the whole sum of uh, economy which we have lost during the Second World War. Uh, but as you know, uh, the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991 when the uh, members of the Union decided to split. And the modern history of Russia started um, in uh, 1991, and uh, there were a transitional crisis uh, during the late 90s, right? Then there was a slow recovery in the, uh, in the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, we had a fast growth during the beginning of the 21st century when the uh, oil prices were really high, so the uh, economics were, uh, was pushed to rise and the rule was stable, <coughs> so on and so forth. And uh, after the international financial crisis, we had the slow growth, and for sure this, uh, uh, the growth we have now is not so optimistic. So, uh, which are the key problems of the Russian history? So, uh, we came to the millennium, uh, with no peace, uh, with regular wars, not uh, the wars, uh, wars of uh, that type, of the 20th century type, but the modern ones, right? Uh, when we have these conflicts with neighbors, 
uh, not always military, but still um, the hugest Russian problem of modernity is the informational war. So um, the attack on Russia are really multiple, right? I mean the informational attack. Um, when you open your browser, you will always see an information about Russia acting as an aggressor, Russia implementing some measures contra her poor neighbors, etc., etc. So please be careful with this, because for sure the um, 21st century got us to be very um, open to the world, right? We get a lot of information, huge amount of information, and our brain is not able to understand which information is uh, true and which is false. So, um, I insist that the hugest Russian problem now is uh, a constant attack in terms of uh, informational wars. And uh, for sure, uh, the beginning of the new history of Russia uh, in the beginning of uh, 1990s, um, at the end of the uh, <coughs> century, was shock for people uh, and uh, a change of elites. Because you know that uh, we call 90s in Russian uh, dashy and slashy years, right? So uh, the change was really unexpected, I mean, for the majority of people. So uh, it's, it was not understood how should we act further. So uh, the uh, people have uh, had feelings on that something bad happened and they do not understand how to act in the circumstances of a market economy. Uh, so uh, what exactly has to be transformed uh, during uh, a country transition? So uh, the most crucial thing is um, property and control handover and uh, control uh, over economic decision making. So when you have the central plant economy and you suddenly decide to switch to a uh, market economy, you have to take a lot of decisions of uh, how to distribute the property, right? Should the property be state or should it be uh, private, etc., etc. So a uh, political system has to be changed also. And so the civil society and political parties should be renovated and the rights and values of population should be also uh, recognized and resolved and um, you should find the new way of the development for the new society. <coughs> so uh, the three cameras were authorized uh, when uh, the Russian came to uh, its modern <coughs> history uh, and the external markets were opened suddenly, right? Uh, so on what extent should we measure this uh, e-commerce authorization and this open market? And uh, the financial system should be also set up from the beginning. So savings, financial tools, etc., etc., all these uh, were to revise. Uh, and for sure, uh, jobs, income, and society structure should be also renovated. So uh, you can imagine that it happens in a few period of time, right? So uh, the government had to take a lot of decisions, and not only uh, economic decisions, but also social decisions, etc., etc. Um, so, the goals of the transformation uh, were to get country to the democracy and to the market economy. And uh, in long term, uh, the country should, be, uh, should become 
uh, middle developed market economy um, from middle developed uh, planned economy. So now, 28 years uh, after, we have it, for sure. But in the beginning of this long way to the uh, new type of the economy, uh, it was really hard to act as an economic uh, reasonable uh, economic reasonable, reasonable agents. Uh, so and uh, the strategy uh, implemented by the government of that time was like the market will make it. So as uh, Adam Smith, right? But. Uh, uh, as you can understand, economy can do it, but not everything, right? So the uh, economy still uh, needs to be governed, at least at the beginning of the transformation. Um, and uh, so, what were the uh, difficulties and loses of the transitional period, period of uh, Russian economy, so uh, foreign capital used to be uh, understood as a threat and the corruption which came with uh, the transformation of the economy uh, was quite an excuse of doing nothing, so the corruption still is a problem, but you know, uh, in those times it was understood uh, as an excuse of doing nothing. And uh, uh, for sure, uh, external criticism, uh, which started from the Soviet Union, uh, came the same uh, during the period of uh, modern Russia. So um, we still have this uh, period of criticism and uh, anti-Russian phobias, right? Uh, and for sure, uh, global competition, like chasing, right, like race for uh, getting a better economic system was still the same because we are right in the context of uh, changing uh, global world. When the new superpower countries came on the arena, uh, and um, we still uh, had to keep in mind all this transition. And uh, for sure, uh, the fall of uh, GDP in 1991 was quite dramatic. It was uh, minus 16%. So uh, and the uh, political issue and economical issue it was crucial. Uh, so what did Russia obtain after the collapse of the USSR? So uh, more than 80% of the territory. So still uh, um, Russia uh, stays uh, the biggest country in the world even after the uh, collapse of the USSR. 51% uh, of USSR population stayed in Russia. 60% uh, of industry, 50% uh, of agriculture, uh, the growth of army, uh, uh, including nuclear army, uh, universities and science about 90%. Uh, <coughs> Sorry. Embassies and foreign buildings are. Uh, well, state in Russia in exchange for debts. Uh, and uh, Russia paid uh, all the debts of the USSR and uh, forgave some debts of other countries uh, for Russia. And uh, we got more uh, mining and extraction uh, in Kazakhstan, but less manufacturing with Belarus, uh, Belarus and the West as a whole. So um, here you can see uh, the dynamics of GDP, uh, GDP per capita in uh, constant prices uh, in the countries of former USSR and uh, some other countries for references. Uh, you can see that 
uh, GDP, uh, GDP, GDP per capita uh, of Russia is uh, still the biggest in the common US countries, uh, but uh, the uh, dynamic uh, is not so uh, viral in the last years. And uh, you can um, measure it with some other countries, for example, with Turkey, uh, which has uh, quite a uh, strong economic growth during the last years. Uh, in terms of uh, death, birth, and natural increase in Russia, we had a huge crisis. You can see uh, that the uh, growth of uh, population was even minus, right? And it, it, it started to rise only a few years ago. And GDP per capita in terms uh, of prices, you can also see uh, that it was slowing down and that uh, it was recovering during uh, that period of uh, strong oil prices and it dropped during the financial crisis of 2008-2009 and now it had, a, it had a, a still recovery but before the uh, Ukrainian crisis. Uh, so, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, household incomes, right? Here you have the uh, table which um, shows you the percentage of households with uh, access to the internet, to the telephones, or to the computer. And you can see that here uh, the percentage of households which has an access to this, all this type of communication is quite high. Uh, and oh, so, and there. Um, Key indicators during three uh, periods, during the first one with the beginning of the transformation, the second one when we had a quite rising um, ruble and uh, international oil price, and the rest um, quite by now. We can see that the gross domestic product fall dramatically uh, during the period of transformation. Transformation, uh, then uh, it was rising during the period of strong oil price, and it's quite moderate now uh, with all this period of uh, financial crisis and international political crisis. So uh, you can also uh, mention that the uh, industrial production was rising during the second period. This is uh, notable and it, it fall dramatically during the period of transformation. All the industrial production fall dramatically uh, because the um, transformation of uh, economic system uh, was really hard, right? And uh, a lot of uh, uh, manufacturers a lot of other uh, other industries uh, were closed during the transformation, and we need some period of recovery to push it on uh, once more. Uh, as for uh, personal consumption, you can see that uh, durable goods occupy twelve percent of. Um, uh, personal consumption of uh, Russian household and non durable occupy 50%, which is not a good measure for uh, developed countries, right? So, uh, this is uh, still the problem of the uh, dis distribute of uh, income between different types of goods of households in Russia. So, uh, different type of programs are, are stimulating the shift to, to the more percentage of uh, durable and semi-durable goods because no durable goods are uh, not stable. 
So, uh, industrial production, you can see uh, on these graphs, so uh, the fall of the period of transformation was really huge and the recovery was quite fast before the uh, financial crisis, international financial crisis, and then uh, it's still um, quite moderate. Um, besides the fact that Russian households spend um, about 50% of non durable goods, the gadgets uh, in Russia now are uh, quite popular. You can see that uh, in comparison with uh, the beginning of uh, Russian modern history and the uh, contemporary time. Uh, there are all these measures of um, life of good quality, right? Uh, they augmented a lot. So, uh, if uh, in 1992 only 23% of uh, households had a, a personal car, now it's uh, 65%. So, um, you can see uh, another different type of uh, measures which came uh, to a household and which can show that uh, the uh, level, level of uh, living in Russia uh, has risen in the context of uh, changing international economy also. Uh, one of the major problems also is the uh, inequal <coughs> distribution of population in uh, different uh, regions of Russia. So, uh, as you can see, uh, the uh, uh, population tends to live um, either in the <coughs> federal district or in uh, Volga federal district, so in the central part of Russia. And uh, the um, density of population for some region, regions is uh, really low, and the density of population in central region is really high, so uh, the majority of people tend to uh, migrate to big cities uh, like Moscow, St. Petersburg, uh, where you have the high education, uh, the majority of universities, uh, where you have the more possibilities to get a job, a uh, qualified job, and well paid job, and so on and so forth. So uh, the problems of the unequal distribution of population is still uh, big for Russia. And uh, despite the existing uh, federal programs of uh, measuring and uh, trying to smooth the difference between the level of living in uh, different regions um, exist, still uh, this problem uh, is caused by unequal uh, level of living. And uh, what about the structure of the economy? Uh, for sure, uh, natural resource, uh, resources, especially oil and gas, dominate in uh, Russian exports. So uh, we also have these elements of Dutch disease, right? Uh, but uh, not only the Dutch disease is uh, the um, uh, major uh, trigger of um, Russian economy. So um, we can also call it the uh, paradox of plenty, right? When the countries with the huge natural resources tend to develop less. There are for sure the exceptions. But still, uh, Russia is in the in those group of countries which uh, has this problem, the uh, paradox of plenty, and um, which uh, not tends to um, diversify its export a lot. But uh, during the last periods, uh, we had several programs which led to the. Uh, export diversification, <coughs> and we'll talk about it a little bit. And for sure, uh, other important industry is Russian defense <coughs> industry, uh, which employs uh, about 3 million people. 
and accounts for 20% of all manufacturing jobs. Uh, well, this is the world's second largest conventional arms exporter of the United States. And you can read about different types of weapons and aircraft which were exporting to different uh, regions of the world. Space industry for sure uh, consists, uh, still is uh, one of the uh, most important industries of Russian economy. Uh, you can find out the names of the, uh, the producing uh, factories. They are named either after um, Russian engineers or after some uh, political politicians, but still they are uh, on the right road and exporting and producing uh, a lot of uh, space shipments. And uh, to my mind, the last way uh, which took Russia several years ago is to diversify its export by uh, um, investing in agriculture. Um, agriculture used to be the uh, major um, branch of uh, Russian economy before the time of the USSR, but then came uh, the Cold War, etc. So the industrialization came on the first stage, and uh, in the beginning of the 90s, the agriculture was ruined. But uh, as we can see with the good examples of uh, huge agricultural exporters like Brazil, uh, like India. So agriculture can be not the uh, pre-industrialized uh, period of development, but also a scientific intensive period of uh, development. So for Russia, agriculture can be a panacea, right, to overcome the dependency on oil and gas exporting and uh, to become a, a huge player on international markets. And uh, here I showed you the uh, four aspects of food security um, um, named by FAO, Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. And as you can see, there are several aspects like food availability, uh, the ability of country uh, to produce uh, food of appropriate quality, uh, food access and the ability of country to provide uh, economic resources to your population to get uh, this um, uh, state of food security. Uh, the utilization, uh, which means uh, that uh, all uh, population should get uh, an adequate diet and clean water to, uh, uh, to, uh, to require all the needs of the body and the stability. Uh, to be food secure, a population, uh, a household or an individual must have access to adequate food uh, at all times. So this is an international um, explanation of food security, but there is also a national food security and there is two points of view on this uh, subject. So uh, one type of uh, researchers and politicians uh, think that only domestic products should participate in the um, process of providing food security to the nation, so uh, like a self-sufficiency. And uh, the second point of view tells us that not only the domestic producers, but the international producers also can participate in the providing <coughs> the food security to the nation. So their uh, stable import is uh, also considered to be the, uh, one of the measures of food security. And in this context, um, what we are having now on the international arena, uh, the majority of countries for sure tend to produce food for themselves in a big share of uh, the food consumed. But 
the international trade uh, made it easier right, to uh, import some types of goods and uh, this is not a threat to the uh, national security. So uh, that's why on the international arena there are a lot of food producers and food uh, importers. Right? And this balance uh, on the international food market is quite stable um, when we are not talking about some uh, political measures like happened uh, with this food ban of 2014. Uh, and uh, for Russia, uh, it was quite a trigger right, to start producing more. So despite the fact that um, uh, it influenced a lot of the domestic market and the prices uh, were rising and rising. Still, the Russian producers had this opportunity to circumstance um, their um, uh, imported products by local one. So, um, there are two levels of food security uh, the quantity of food and the quality of food. If the quantity of food can be raised in quite a short term, uh, the quality of food for sure of domestic food needs to be uh, prepared uh, in a middle term and in a long term. So now uh, what we have on a Russian agricultural market, uh, we have uh, a big percentage of uh, domestically produced food and uh, our producers felt themselves uh, more, uh, more safe right, with this food ban. So uh, despite the fact that for, for the consumers the food ban was quite uh, an unexpected and was quite painful because we, for example, we really miss uh, French cheese etc etc <laughs> yeah because our producers are, are not able to produce the cheese of the quality of the french cheese for sure they need time if we can produce hard cheese uh, quite well because peter the great bought the recipe from holland so uh, centuries ago and still we need some time to our producers to uh, start making soft cheeses like french cheeses but still uh, how uh, the level of Russian dependency of the import, on the import of from banned countries. So 14% of fruits and vegetables uh, were coming from Western countries, from European <coughs> Union, from the United States, from Australia. 13% uh, of fish, 8% uh, of chicken, 7% of beef, 13% uh, of for, uh, pork and this painful 33% of cheese. <laughs> and uh, what happened when the food ban was implemented? So um, it was not only the opportunity for Russian producers to uh, uh, raise their share on the internal market, but also for the producers from uh, BRICS countries to raise their share on our market because uh, their, uh, their products are really of high quality, right? But the, <coughs> but the distance matters. And for sure, uh, European Union was the first uh, exporter of their uh, agricultural products to our market. But uh, after the food ban, uh, for example, Latin American countries called it the opportunity, the open window, uh, for uh, Brazilian, Argentinian, and Uruguay, Uruguay meat uh, to get to Russian market. And now we can state that the share of um, goods from Latin America, from South Africa, from China uh, is really uh, raising, right? But at the same time, the uh, national producers are also capturing the market. And uh, okay, so it took five years right, to um, get to this um, situation one uh, when the price is, uh, the food price is not rising so um, 
increasingly like uh, in the beginning of the food ban. And so, uh, talking back about the uh, possibilities for Russia to um, diversify its export position on the food market. Uh, our competitive advantage in agriculture are really impressive. Uh, so, 3.3% of world farmland, right? And 9% of world arable land, 20% uh, of water resources. Russia has uh, the second um, world largest world, uh, water resources after Brazil. And uh, some positive impact of climate change, uh, which, uh, is, uh, which can be sound a little bit strange, but still the global warming, as we um, can investigate it, um, tends to um, help Russia in some regions to produce uh, more food. I mean, so some regions became uh, warmer and so different types of uh, crops can be produced now in Moscow region, in uh, Volga region, etc., etc. So uh, taking all this together, uh, Russia has the world's highest potential for agricultural development and uh, I uh, really hope that uh, this strategy will help Russia to overcome this uh, crisis of being only uh, oil, gas and weapon producer on the international market. Um, so, um, what, so, I will skip it because uh, I'm quite out of time. I will send it to you. So, um, but what should we do to become one of the leading exporters? You can see here the picture of Nikolai Vanishvalilov, our great Russian gen gen geneticist, uh, who um, were uh, pioneering the uh, genetics and the, um, how it's called, when you <coughs> cultivate new types of crops. Selection. Okay. Uh, so selection and genetics uh, in the beginning of the time of the uh, USSR uh, were really on top, but then during the industrialization it was quite uh, ruined. And now to become uh, uh, one of the uh, leading exporters of uh, food products on the market, we should uh, rebuild the science, uh, the um, agricultural science, right? Because uh, we need our own technologies. We cannot just import uh, types of crops and animals. We should uh, cultivate and produce uh, the new forms of animals and crops on our own. What, for example, did uh, Brazil and also Argentina, uh, they use this type of agriculture which is called precision agriculture. So uh, what does it mean? It means that the farmers investigate carefully all the physical, chemical, geographical qualities of land before making a decision which particular plant uh, will give the richest harvest on the place you have. So for sure, this type of uh, agricultural production needs investment, right? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it takes time, it takes money, but still um, we can see that this agricultural miracle, uh, which happened uh, in Brazil, for example, uh, happened partly thanks to this system. So I think that to become more diversified, to, be, to uh, get more economic rights, uh, Russia needs to become more uh, scientific intensive in key branch of uh, its uh, economy, not only in uh, producing oil and gas, but also in agriculture, uh, in education for sure, uh, in uh, uh, different types of industry. So, uh, this is my point. Thank you so much.